saying that the 14700K is less efficient is ludicrous! Unless we were specifically talking about gaming! I'm betting a paycheck! Put both at the same wattage. The 14700K will beat the crap out of the 7800X3D in every single workload. It will be both faster and more efficient. Somebody say snake oil? This is the tweet we got after we declared the 7800X3D to be the best overall CPU of 2023. To which we replied, I bet. Get that paycheck ready. But much like Greg number one with the sample size comment we replied to previously, Greg number two here brings up an excellent point. It's one we've considered, which is that there's a lot to discuss outside of just all core work for power consumption and power efficiency. And even though this tweet is maybe a bit defensive and seeking validation, it is something worth more scientifically exploring. So that's what we're going to do today. We're really curious about what the results are. And the goal is that scientific approach, which is we don't care who wins or loses here, but we really want to see how does the lineup change for AMD versus Intel for power efficiency or energy consumption uh, when we start looking at gaming workloads. We already know how it works in something like Blender. Today's tests include not only gaming power consumption without constraints, or basically out of the box how most people would use it, but also with some one-off constraints, like ISO power or ISO FPS matching or normalizing for the same power consumption between two competing chips, the same frame rate between two competing chips, so they're producing the same unit of work in the test pass, in addition to those stock tests. This also has some cool tests that look at some of the spikier behaviors where, actually, if you look between the games, so when you're loading things or when you're bringing assets in to render, the CPU power consumption can spike a lot, depending on the test case. Uh, so these are some of the things we're looking at. We've long said that our biggest weakness in power testing for CPU and GPU has been we mostly look at a fully 100% loaded set of cores for either of those devices. And that's not always the use case. So finally, we get to approach that, look at how it changes under some of these conditions that are really common real world use cases. Uh, and we get to use a special PMD interposer that we bought from Elmore Labs. This thing is really cool. This massive test took us a month to complete and is entirely funded by you, our viewers, and people like Greg when they forfeit an entire paycheck to make a bad bet. For Greg and everyone else, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab our brand new GN15 all over print component design mouse mat. This is a full surface mouse mat that'll fit your mouse and your keyboard and we're launching it in this very video. The mats have a unique bright yellow rubber underside to contrast vibrantly with the bright blue stitching for anti-fray and for endurance at the border. They also have small PC parts printed and scattered all over them with a high resolution print and a sharp looking ink. This is alongside our GN15 15 year anniversary logo. These yellow, black, and blue mouse mats are one of the best ways to support our deep dive content right now and they're available in both standard and autographed variants. And Greg, just add a few to your cart and we'll call it even. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support this type of content. Here's the plan. Currently we produce power consumption charts that look like this and power efficiency charts that look like this. The reason gaming isn't normally in there is because it's actually kind of challenging to look at and a lot of that is because of the variability. So game to game it's extremely different sometimes. You'll see like a doubling of power consumption depending on the game. And it doesn't matter if it's fully CPU constrained in both, they just behave different ways. It's not as simple as CPU is 100% load, therefore power is the same for all 100% loads. They do different things at 100%. And also depending on how you look at 100% and define it, it might not really be the same thing. So like task manager, for instance, or if you're looking at 100% because it's single thread bound versus all core bound. So these are all things that need to be defined. So long term, we need to pick some games that'll be our representatives for gaming power consumption testing. And this is part of the exploratory process for that. This is not only a one-off cool feature, but it's also defining our future methodologies and approaches and selections for this testing because we want to integrate these long-term and reviews. Now, not only are games different one to the next, but also the power consumption within the game fluctuates a lot. So as mentioned earlier, in the loading screen versus in gameplay, both of those are valid and real scenarios. Uh, but they might change. And even actually just within gameplay, you'll see differences as you move around because at different times, it might be CPU bound or GPU bound without necessarily being fully constrained on either one sort of ad infinitum. Today's test will involve a few different metrics of efficiency, all of them collected with this device and validated 
with a current clamp. First, we'll focus on FPS per watt. This will be done both unrestrained or out of the box and with a few one-off tests that control for FPS or for power. In instances where we're controlling for FPS, we're fixing it to 60 or 144 FPS, which means we're not really going to be bound up on any one component because we're artificially constraining it. But that out-of-the-box number is the one that we are prioritizing as our metric today. We have to pick something as a baseline. That's what we've chosen, and the reasoning for that's pretty simple. It's how most people use the device. We'll also provide a watt-hours chart for Blender, which many of you are familiar with from our reviews. Uh, and we will also have the 14700K power controlled in that, which increases the render time requirement, but also increases the efficiency. And then additionally, we're providing a MIPS per watt, or millions of instructions per second per watt chart, for our 7-zip testing, which looks at compression. Finally, we'll be looking at some numbers for the maximum 10-point and 30-point non-consecutive power consumption uh, collect data during these tests. And that allows us to look at the entire measurement pass. That includes those in-between loading scenes or uh, pulling assets, stuff that might be compression or decompression type of work that could be more heavily loaded than, say, just running the game. And there are a lot of ways that all of this testing could be done for efficiency, uh, but our main interest is just in looking at how the CPUs perform pulling power in through the EPS 12 volt cables. Now, realistically, almost no one is constricting their 14700K to 90 watts uh, or their 14900K to 90 watts, especially. And if you're one of the people posting a comment right now saying, um, actually, I did, then first of all, congratulations. We're one of a very small percentage of people who is doing that. But we will be looking at those metrics anyway. All right, enough of the setup. Let's get into some of the testing. Let's start with something easy as a reference point. This is F1 2023, which runs in the hundreds of frames per second. The chart shows average FPS per watt with higher, meaning better efficiency. The average power consumption is next to the CPU name, rounded to the closest whole number. Here's the reveal. The 7800X3D is unbelievably power efficient here, producing almost 10 frames per second on average per watt of power consumed at the interposer. The total EPS 12 volt power was 52 watts for the 7800X3D, while it spewed about 511 FPS on average. The 7950X3D is close by, with the 5800X3D also posting incredibly strong results at almost 8 FPS per watt. In fact, AMD dominates almost the entire top half of the results. With only Intel's i3-12100F, a CPU which we've awarded best sub $100 CPU twice now, ranking alongside AMD's 5000 and 7000 series choices. The 12100F at 34 watts was able to run at about 246 FPS average. Intel's best performer, in terms of frame rate, was the 4900K, and that was the least efficient on this chart. It makes sense, they're well past the volt frequency efficiency points. Its frame rate was 422 FPS average, while its power consumption was about 123 watts on average. That's lower than a 100% workload, but still less efficient than AMD's competition. Now we're way ahead of you. We figured that some people might not like this scenario because it's completely valid, fair, realistic, and out of the box as you use the processor. So we also ran this ISO FPS, or at a locked frame rate, for 144 in this particular title, just because the frame rate is so comically high already. Now, this is important for a few reasons. First, it makes sure we are neither fully CPU or GPU bound throughout the entire test. Rather, we are restricted by an external limitation, which is the frame rate limiter. Uh, secondly, it forces a like-for-like -like unit of work as a rate, or 144 FPS, uh, for direct comparison. And our CPUs are now producing that same amount of frames so we can just look at the power consumption kind of in isolation. Here it is. It's the same chart, but with two new entries. The 14900K and 7800X3D both have equalized FPS entries now. Both CPUs become less efficient than they were natively. Makes sense. We're cutting the frame rate down. The 7800X3D is now pulling 30 watts, and the Intel CPU is pulling 76 watts. In terms of FPS per watt, that means AMD maintains a significant advantage at 4.9 to Intel's 1.9. 4.9 is 158% higher than 1.9, and our previous metrics would have had AMD's 9.8 at 188% higher than Intel's 3.4. So, in words, AMD's favor has reduced, but it still maintains a significant lead even with equal FPS. So this is a good test because it helps us to address one of the many challenges with this benchmarking, which is if we were to hit, say, an external component limitation like a GPU bind, on the better performing of the parts, that will change the way these efficiency numbers look. It's one of the challenges of this. 
uh, it's not something you can really deal with in a great way while staying in real world. So these frame rate limiters really help with that. And now we've eliminated that concern with this particular one-off. So there's also the same kind of metric that we use when talking about a single frame rendered in Blender. The only difference this time is we know the unit of time, whereas with Blender, that's one of the variables, which is how long does it take to complete the fixed unit of work with the power that's measured. Part of why AMD's rating deranked a little bit is because the floor for its IO die is relatively fixed. So we're approaching power consumption where the baseline required just to sustain operation of the chip becomes uncuttable, even though the core power is reducing. The only thing left to look at would be a power limit on Intel. We'll do that soon. This next one is really interesting. In Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty, we observed the power consumption was much closer to what we saw in Blender. That's because the CPU load is so heavy in this one. The 14900K was around 200 watts, so it's much higher than an F1. Because of our viewer who asserted that power locking the 14700K would make it more efficient in all workloads than the AMD parts, we decided to do that with this one. The 14700K, when it was at 164 watts, unlimited, yielded about 1 FPS per watt, nearly 1 to 1. The 86 watt limited 14700K ran at 1.7 FPS per watt, which is a significant uplift in efficiency. The raw FPS trade-off was about 22 FPS reduced with that change, and Intel is definitely way past the efficiency part of the volt frequency curve, but we already knew that for its stock operation. Unfortunately for our viewer and his paycheck, the 14700K remains in the lower half of this chart. It is neither faster, nor is it more efficient. Even AMD's 7700X, which is functionally at power parity with the 14700K with its 91 watt draw, and actually helping the tweeter out, it's worse than the 7800X 3D, that still yielded a 1.9 FPS per watt result. The 7700X is directly comparable in power, and it's not even AMD's best gaming part. The 7800X 3D and 7950X 3D both broke 3 FPS per watt in this game, producing phenomenally efficient performance. The 7600 was up there as well, about tied with the 5800X 3D and the i3-12100F. The i5-13400F also broke into this category. We wanted to be sure we had a heavier GPU load for some additional testing, so we ran Phantom Liberty at 1440p Ultra. This dropped the frame rate of both CPUs tested significantly as the GPU began limiting our ceiling, and that was intentional. Here, the 14900K still pulled 190 watts, with the 7800X3D at about 72 watts. The 7800X3D remained the more efficient of the CPUs. The frame rate overall has come down, and that's again because of the increase in GPU load, and so it's natural that the FPS per watt figure drops, just how the math ends up working out. That's normal with the settings quality increase, and you can't directly compare these numbers to the prior charts unless you're primarily comparing graphics efficiency cost. But comparing the two CPUs to each other on this chart does show that the hierarchy remains the same. The star field is an interesting one because Intel leads this chart in frame rate as opposed to AMD's X3D CPUs. You can see that here. The 14900K ran at about 132 FPS average originally with the 7800X3D at 115 FPS average. That should bias the math in Intel's favor, depending on its power consumption, as it tips the frame rate higher to potentially yield a better calculation. Note that this test was conducted before the recent massive patch, but all the data was done on the same game version, so it's directly comparable. And uh, nope, that didn't help at all. AMD, despite running generally lower frame rate in Starfield than Intel, is still miles ahead for efficiency. The 7800X3D crushes it comparatively, with a 1.9 FPS per watt result. The i3-12100F does excellently here though, so it's the true benefactor of the favorable Intel performance in this game. The 13400F also makes an appearance alongside AMD's R5-5600X and 7600, so it too is doing well overall and gives hope for Intel's efficiency. The 14900K gets 0.6 frames per watt. We had it at about 212 watts against 132 FPS average. We'll check how much of that is the result of the GPU work in a moment, as it's feasible that a CPU still has to work hard to keep up with the GPU. As for AMD's worst performer here, it's the 7700X. It's just a less efficient part of the volt frequency curve. Let's look at how busy that 14900K was with GPU scheduling. For this chart, we're looking at GPU Busy, the new metric we've been talking a lot about lately. We have a couple videos talking about this in more detail, but the basics are that we're showing you the total frame time from one of the test passes as mapped against the GPU Busy or GPU Active, time synchronized. The closer they are to parity, the more loaded the GPU is. In this one, we see that Intel is GPU bound. The GPU is busy almost the entire duration of the frame creation process. That doesn't mean the CPU isn't busy though, it just means the GPU is. And clearly the CPU wasn't sleeping, at least not with that power draw. So the CPU remains busy and in a 
boosted power state where it blasts power regardless. That could be because it's busy tasking the GPU with work, like draw calls, uh, but AMD and the same GPU bound state in, say, F1 didn't produce this behavior. It could also be that the Windows telemetry that Intel is relying on is encouraging it to continue blasting power at its sort of elevated power state. Here's a look at AMD's GPU Busy in the same chart. It wasn't as bound up for Starfield, although in F1 it was hitting a similar GPU bind despite its lack of this power behavior. We can control for this though. We'll run this test again, but this time with two changes. The 7800X3D will be restricted to 60 FPS and so will the 4900K. In this one, the 7800X3D falls from 1.9 FPS per watt to 1.4 with its new FPS of 60 and its new power of 42.5 watts. The Intel 4900K scored 0.5 FPS per watt here, a reduction even from its already bad 0.6 result. So to produce the same work and the same in-game experience, Intel is drawing more total EPS 12 volt power than the AMD part. We've now tested ISO FPS and ISO power for two different sets of CPUs. So what this tells us is that in this scenario, in this specific test that we ran, uh, Intel is, whether it's GPU or CPU bound or artificially engine restricted, it is less efficient in these titles that we're talking about. Baldur's Gate 3 is up next. This one is interesting because it's lower power consumption overall, and the 7800XUD and 7950XUD were the highest FPS in this game, followed by the 4900K. Here again, the efficiency advantage goes to the X3D CPUs, and that includes the 5800X3D, which isn't anywhere near a GPU limit. The 4900K also wasn't at its GPU limit, with the GPU busy time well below our total frame time when we checked. And yet it remains the least efficient on this chart at 146 watts. The 13900K is alongside it and at 135 watts. Intel's most efficient point on the curve here is hit with the 1200F, at least out of the parts present, at 41 watts and 1.6 FPS per watt for the result. 13400F is predictably next in line for Intel. Blender's up now. You all already know this chart, so we'll keep it short. We ran the 14700K at 86 watts limited, which had it at about 91 watts, and the 14700K finally outperforms the 7800X3D. All we had to do was run it in a configuration most users won't use. It produced a 12.1 minute render, which is a massive worsening from the baseline 14700K's 8 minute render. This definitely slowed the CPU down, but it became more efficient. For 7-zip, we're looking at compression performance against power consumption, represented as MIPS per watt, or millions of instructions per second per watt. The 7800X3D leads this chart, despite middling performance for the actual compression rate. The 7950X3D follows it. Uh, both of these are generally good bins with low vCore requirements, making them overall efficient here. Intel's 14900K performs the worst at 707 MIPS per watt. Now for Photoshop, in this one, we only ran the 7800X3D and the 14700K for new numbers, but with the 14700K restricted to the same power budget as the 7800X3D. Here, the 78X3D outperformed the 14700K in overall score, which allowed it to outperform the 14700K in efficiency. Points per watt more or less directly correlates to watt hours, as this test is largely time-based and assigns points accordingly. Let's look at some 10-point and 30-point high averages. So this is specifically pulling the highest 10 seconds and 30 seconds non-consecutively throughout the entire bench suite that we measured. So in all the other, other tests, we isolated for the actual gameplay session where we're collecting the frame rate. So it's like walking around the same area of the map in the same pattern, for example. In this set of tests, we're ignoring whether the game's being played or not, and we're just looking at from test begin, so game launch to game close, what are the highest 10 and 30 points, again, non-consecutively, so we can start looking for spikes. This does not get into transients, so we're not, we would need an oscilloscope for that. We've done that test in the past, not doing it here, uh, so we're not looking at the microsecond level, and um, this gives us an average over the period for which we have the highest numbers coming out of the measurement device. And this also includes the time between the game tests, which can spike higher because of those interesting changes in workload on the CPU. In Phantom Liberty, the 7800X3D's highest points were 70 to 73 watts, running relatively tightly together. The average of 61 is also nearby. The 14900K establishes a much wider gulf with its results. Despite an average during the actual workload of 196 watts, the load before and after the test, where we see that loading interval, pushed it to 272 watts, or 237, for those average peaks. The 14700K was around 202 to 241 watts, also higher than the average in-game load test. This goes to show that it's not only an all-core blender load that'll push CPUs towards the upper bound, but also everyday work, like loading applications, changing levels, pulling assets for a save game. 
These things might involve compression or decompression or other types of instructions that'll fully load the CPU briefly. The 1200F was also the lowest overall power draw, which isn't surprising. It's a good CPU for its price class, and it's not that power hungry. In Starfield, the average peaks were about 68 watts for the 7800 XUD, 79 watts for the 5800 XUD, and 206 for the 14700K, and 244 for the 14900K. So again, it's not as high as the average during actual gameplay, which is shown next to each CPU name but it's high during those intermediary periods where we're loading or preparing the game and the benchmarks. In Baldur's Gate 3, which was overall a middling game for in-game power consumption, despite generally high focus on the CPU, we still saw high spikes on the Intel i7 and i9 categories. The 7800X3D was also a significant percentage higher than the average at 72 watts. 4900K was around 235 to its 146 watt average in-game power drop. Out of curiosity, we also did this for 7-zip. We already know Blender is mostly stuck at the max, but here we saw similar. The 1200F shows us just how it looks when you're already close to the max. 41 watts average against 42 for the 10 and 30 point non-consecutive highs. The 4900K was only 7 watts over its average with this measurement. 7800XCD was also a couple watts over its average. This final section is just to put it all into perspective. Ultimately, the question is, so what? And how much the efficiency matters is up to you. On a scale of a single person, especially at our electricity cost here of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, the difference in total cost is basically a rounding error when it comes down to just the power. But for people in more expensive areas, or if you ignore cost, and you just look at the energy consumption impact multiplied across millions of users, it starts to matter a lot more. We're not qualified to make environmental charts, so let's just look at the numbers. This chart looks at the total cost per year in US dollars, calculated using our total shut-in gaming assumption of eight hours per day with the heaviest game in our test, Cyberpunk. We used six rates that we found across a few online services that aggregate the average cost in populous areas. In our recent YouTube community posts, some of you told us that you pay 45 cents per kilowatt hour or more like in Germany. So obviously the numbers can be higher than what we're gonna show here. Likewise, anyone with a variable rate should just assume the most likely time you're gonna be gaming for the rate. Starting at the extreme of 39 cents per kilowatt hour for what's on our chart, at eight hours of heavy gaming load per day for 365 days, you'd be at a total cost of $70 for the 7800X3D's power consumption or 223 for the 4900K. This is ignoring all other components. This is maybe an instance where it could start to matter, but we are in the heaviest load. Likewise, the 14700K at stock versus 86 watts locked is approaching a $100 difference at 39 cents per kilowatt hour USD. Where we live, we're spoiled by cheap electricity from local nuclear plants. At 10 cents per kilowatt hour, the annual difference at eight hours a day would be 30 bucks between the 14700K and the 7800X3D. If you assume a more normal utilization and less of a shut-in utilization of two hours per day, that'd be closer to seven and a half bucks or so per year energy cost difference. The more expensive your electricity and the more you game, the more this might be relevant to you. We can't fit every cost on this chart, but you can pull up a kilowatt hour cost calculator and run the numbers for yourself. And remember again, this is sort of a worst case scenario and you're gonna burn power on something, so, uh, for this one, we're looking at the CPU. And that should help with perspective to answer that so what question. And it's really up to you if you care or not. So the wrap up then, in a lot of these scenarios without any controls whatsoever, just letting them do their thing out of the box or then sort of normal Expo and uh, XMP stuff, AMD is not only producing better gaming performance in raw frame rate, but at a lower power consumption. And since these two are directly correlated in the formula itself, it makes sense that the efficiency is therefore higher in those situations. And that gives AMD an efficiency advantage in most of the games we tested. Even when we lock the power or the FPS, generally speaking, AMD still maintains an overall efficiency advantage. Now, critically, Blender shows that the 14700K can gain an edge when power is constrained, as opposed to the 7800X3D, although it also has a performance edge here. But that's not true in every production benchmark. In Photoshop, AMD pulled ahead. So unfortunately for Greg number two, that, that paycheck's gonna have to go because uh, every single workload was the qualifying statement there. And it, didn't, it, it actually was not better in every single workload. So sorry, Greg.
You can keep the money or give it to cat angels. I, I don't really care. But we got some cool data out of it. Now, ultimately, we can create as many abstractions and calculations as we want, but it's tough to argue the fact that Intel is operating overall at a less efficient point in its VF curve. That's just fact. The CPUs, especially out of the box, are blasting power to maintain that last bit of frequency bump that they need to stay as competitive as they typically are in gaming scenarios. And yes, we can modify the vCore, we can reduce the power target, we can constrain these CPUs, but at some point, it's not fair to say, but you can do that for one, and then not consider it for the other. It just becomes sort of an arms race, an escalation, or a race to zero, maybe in this case, for power consumption. So uh, AMD can, of course, also be undervolted, but out of the box, no tuning, AMD generally is ahead, or it's ahead more often than it's behind, uh, at least between the 7800X UD and something like a 14700K or 14900K. The 12100F is actually remarkably efficient, and that's because when you think of the volt frequency curve, the amount of frequency you get for the significant increase in voltage required towards the back end of that curve, it, it just starts to go down. And so something like an i799, it's already at that less efficient part of the curve where it starts to jump up in the voltage requirement. This testing was extremely educational. We enjoyed it a lot. It taught us a lot about the processes and about the processors. And we think there are a lot more metrics we can derive from this work. Likewise, we think it's probably something we can begin including long term in our reviews process. It won't be this many games, but we'll probably pick one or two long term representative titles and use them for charts like these in reviews. One interesting point here is that as the overall power consumption comes down, so if the per core power consumption is reduced either from external constraints or just because the game is not really utilizing them that much, uh, AMD's baseline tends to be kind of high relatively in a purely relative sense because it's IO die just to maintain base operation without any external modifications has a relatively high power consumption. This is more notable in something like Threadripper where you might see close to 100 watts for the IO die alone. Uh, in some of the workloads we tested and demonstrated in those reviews. But anyway, this has been really cool and we're excited about it. Let us know which of these games you think might be the ones you'd want to see in long-term reviews. Uh, that will be genuinely helpful for us. Please upvote each other so we know which ones are popular. But we're going to ask you to pick two. It's a lot of work to do these tests and uh, we just want to pick two for long-term. So it's got to be something that you're going to be okay with seeing for the next two to three years because we're going to run everything through those two games. Uh, so choose wisely. We'd probably want one that's on the high end and then the other one's totally up to you. I'm thinking Cyberpunk or Starfield for that higher load. And then the other one, I'm not really sure. You've got a couple options in here. You all can, can discuss it in the comments. Uh, but for this, we will be soon updating the GN Megacharts page for power consumption. This was a, a really common request, and we completely agree with it too, where people were asking about, hey, for this big Megacharts page, can you put some gaming numbers in there? It's also a big request for Idle, which we also agree with, and uh, we'll be running those as soon as we get the chance. It'll be a little while for those, though. Uh, so anyway, we're going to be updating that page with these in the next couple of weeks or so, and um, that gives us a, a pretty fun data set to work on. And let us know what ideas come of it because there's a lot more that can be done here. This has been an, a generally underrepresented aspect of reviewing CPUs for our testing over the years, and now we get to do cool stuff. So thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. As always, go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And Greg, you can just send that paycheck over to Cat Angels or something because let's be real, you sit every single workload, and uh, that was uh, not the case. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.